This is a continuation of the previous message. To be critical of high praise is to join the rank of the religious Pharisee, the worst critic of true spiritual worship. Now, we've got a few passages we want to do just a brief study in this regard, in this fourth point here. It's to join the rank of the old stuffed shirts of Jesus' day, the hypocrites called the Pharisees, the worst critics you could imagine of true spiritual worship. They would find fault with what we do here. They, they did in Jesus' day. If you turn over to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40, Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. Now, we've got to remember that all Scripture is given by inspiration. It's profitable for us. We're to learn from these things. There are messages contained everywhere in Scripture and in every part of Scripture. And there's a message here for us as well. And we have a rather long section, verses 28 through 40. You don't just have one verse here. You've got it in its context here. And we see the attitude of the religious stuffed shirts in Jesus' day. They didn't like some of that noise and dancing and that hosanning around him. They didn't like that. And they were critical of that. Beginning to read in verse 28. When he had thus spoken, Jesus went up before, ascending up to Jerusalem. It came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, into which at your entering ye you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. If any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt. And they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. I don't know how you could find a modern parallel in your own life to duplicate that. I've often said I'd like to sacrifice a bullock before the Lord so you can actually do it and see it. You're so happy for all that God's done for you. But they put their clothes down so a donkey could stomp on them and walk over them. But the Lord was on that donkey, though. Would you throw your suit coat down? Now, don't throw it down for some human being like you do have in some, you know, radical charismatic service worshiping some false religious leader or something. Would you throw your sport coat down for the Lord? Say, well, no, of course I would. Will you dance before him? Well, no, I don't think so. What's the difference then? When he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples... Now, we know they were a little fickle. They praised him here and ran later. But let's don't get into the after picture, just the before. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God as the Bible taught. Right? Not in any church way, but with a loud voice. You want even a better proof in Psalms of whether or not God approves of loud voices, of loud praise, of loud worship. They began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Quoting from one of the Psalms there. Of course, they didn't think he was so blessed later on. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. All sounds well, doesn't it? Well, until we meet these stuffed shirts. There's always somebody there to put a pin in the balloon. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Teacher, make them be quiet. They're making us nervous. Rebuke thy disciples. They'll come to you in a non-charismatic or a non-charismatic charismatic service. We'll rebuke you. Be quiet. You're praising too loudly. Teacher, Master, rebuke thy disciples. In other words, make them be quiet. All that loud noise, voice, rejoice, praise that they're doing. Make them be quiet. Rebuke them. Now, what's his response to loud rejoicing and praising? And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. 
Hallelujah. I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, that seems to be a reference from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 11. He seems to be using some imagery borrowed from that. The context in Habakkuk 2.11, of course, is not similar to Luke 19, but the apostles, as well as the Lord, they follow his example. But the apostles in the New Testament often use Old Testament passages out of, quote, their Old Testament context, unquote, but they use them as the Holy Spirit directs them to, which means that it is in context, because the one who's inspiring the apostles to use the Old Testament in a certain way in the New is the same one who has, and who's the only one who has the fullness of the revelation of all past, present, future, possible meanings of some Old Testament verse. So you're not using it out of context that the Holy Spirit inspires that, because he's the one who knows what the fullness of the passage means. But it seems to come from Habakkuk 2.11. Now, Back in Luke 19.40, there are various interpretations as to what Jesus really meant by what he said. I want to give you some of those. Well, there's really basically one important interpretation. There are some other minor ones, but there's one basic important interpretation that's found among a lot of the writers. When Jesus said, I tell you that if these, that is, these people, these disciples, they're called disciples in verse 37, if these disciples should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. What does he mean? Literally rocks? Literally stones? Well, stones can't talk. Stones can't cry out. And so one interpretation that you find is that what Jesus really has here is a reference to eventually the gospel message going to the Gentile world. And that this was a rabbinic practice to refer to the Gentiles as stones. You know, they're just rocks out there. The Gentiles are like stones to we Jews, we important living human beings before God. So in other words, Jesus is saying, I tell you that if the Jews hold their peace, the Gentiles will receive the message and immediately cry out. Well, that's certainly possible. We know that is what happened. The Jews turned against him. He took the kingdom from them temporarily allowed Gentile entrance into the kingdom through the church, and the church has been basically Gentile down through history. But Habakkuk 2.11 is talking about real timbers, real rafters, real stones. So who am I, who can anybody be, who am I to say that he didn't mean real stone unless I can prove it somehow? Who am I to say he doesn't mean stones? If he said stones, then I guess he means stones. I don't have any way of proving that he doesn't mean that. I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You see, what we've got to remember is that whenever Jesus, let me set the scene for you here a little bit in the background, whenever Jesus made his, what is called his triumphal entry, I don't know where people really got that terminology, because it was somewhat triumphal and somewhat not. Whenever he got there, they killed him. I don't know if that's a triumph or not, but whenever he came into Jerusalem, he came in, there's no question about it, as a messianic figure. He came in as a fulfillment of Old Testament promise. This wasn't like a normal trip to Jerusalem that he had made to minister on earlier occasions. Do you remember that Zechariah prophesied, Behold, thy king cometh, riding on an ass, a donkey, and so forth. He had prophesied that, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. That was a messianic prophecy. Behold, thy king cometh. And in verse 38, the people, whenever they give him this shout of acclamation, have combined several different prophecies. Maybe, well, you don't have the references, but they say, Blessed be the king, that's Zechariah 9.9, that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's Psalm 118.26. They combine two different Old Testament scriptures And evidently, the Jews felt both of those were messianic, so I guess they were. They knew their Bible in that regard. They knew what to apply to the Messiah. Let's turn back there and look at those passages over in uh, the book of Psalms in the first place, Psalm 118. That's in the same context as this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118.24. And then we get down to verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And we don't really need to read anymore. I don't see anything about king there, though. 
Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they, they told him that once, and then he told them later that you won't see me again until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Because they cast him out and killed him as not being from God, as being a blasphemer, one, a man who made himself equal with God, when in fact he was. And he said in Matthew 23, You won't see me again until you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So that must be a messianic prophecy. And then over in Zechariah's prophecy, the Jews in Jesus' day, you see, have joined these two. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout! How do you like that? You see, the Jews are doing that in Luke 19. They knew what the Old Testament taught them. With a loud voice, they rejoiced and praised God. Rejoice greatly. Well, there would be another, by the way, parallel passage for Psalm 149, high praise. You can rejoice or you can rejoice greatly. That's the same as high praise, with the high praises of God on our mouth. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. And he's just having salvation, lowly riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. Matthew talks about that. John does. Luke has a reference to it. And it all traces itself back to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. All right, back to Luke 19. Here's what I'm saying. This wasn't some normal entry into Jerusalem of Jesus. This had messianic significance and overtone to it. He came as Messiah, and some of the people were praising him as the Messiah who has come. So this was a very significant experience in Jesus' earthly ministry to fulfill. Remember, he said he didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill all the law and the prophets. And there were certain first advent prophecies that he was there to fulfill literally in his own body and flesh. And here was one of them. Psalm 118.26, Zechariah 9.9. So when he said, if these hold their peace, the scripture has to be fulfilled. Now what did the scripture say? Rejoice and shout, daughter of Zion. Not Gentiles, daughter of Zion. Rejoice greatly and shout. The scriptures have to be fulfilled. The scripture of Zechariah 9, 9 has to be fulfilled. Rejoice and shout. If he's fulfilling it, we know that the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is the fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. We've got to have that whole verse fulfilled. Rejoice and shout. The Jews don't. He said, I tell you, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, you see the Pharisees are manifesting. They don't know the law very well after all, do they? They don't know the Old Testament very well after all. Or they know it except whenever their own situation gets in the way. Then they violate the word of God. They know there's got to be a Messiah coming in fulfilling Zechariah. But they don't want all that shouting and praising directed toward this man, Jesus of Nazareth. They don't want that. Rebuke thy disciples. They don't believe he's God. Some of the people do. At least in their head they do. The Pharisees don't even in their head. And he said, I tell you, if they hold their peace, if these people, if these Jews hold their peace, there will be some Jewish stones that will immediately speak up and fill in the gap. I don't see any reason why it can't mean that. And I've got something else to add into that. God made a donkey talk. He made him talk so that he was understandable and comprehensible. God made, and that's a miracle. Say, well, a stone can't talk, neither can a donkey. You say, well, at least the donkey can make noise. Well, so can a rock. Just watch when it falls on your car. Say, well, I need a donkey to make noise. So what? That noise is as far away from intelligent human utterance as the lack of sound from a rock. A donkey's no closer to human communication. Come on, even the experts will tell you that. To human communication, that's been proven too. The experts will tell you that. There is an unpassable gulf between intelligent conversation from an animal and the intelligent conversation that we humans conduct our lives by. So a donkey with his noise is no closer. With his voice, with his gruntings and groanings, and he's no closer than a stone. And if the God of creation can make a donkey, he can make a donkey to talk. If God can make a rock, then he can make a rock to talk. So what will be the purpose? Well, what's the purpose of, you know, you being alive? You fool, if you're going to start asking questions like that, I don't see any purpose in you being around. Right? With questions like that, when talking about purposes, what's your purpose? You're not fulfilling any that I can see in life to raise questions like that. 
except you're fulfilling your father the Pharisee's purpose to even raise questions like that. I believe a rock can talk. If God wants a rock to talk, come on. I mean, if he's God, he can do it. If he wants it that way, he's going to do it that way. And if he wants it that way just so that nobody except four people will believe it, then, then he's going to do it that way. So the babes get it, nobody else does. I can receive a rock talking. I think I could. <laughs> I'm listening. Do I hear in the backyard? You know, go by. Hello there. Who was that? <laughs> I won't say that he made a bush talk, but he talked out of a bush in Exodus 3. Maybe that's the whole situation. Maybe the rock wouldn't talk, but God would speak through the rock or something. I don't know. I don't have to figure that out, but I know that some utterance, some sound, language would come from that rock. He made a bush talk. A bush. I know it says God was in the bush. God was in the burning bush, but it was still a bush, though. And Moses was as terrified by that as probably I would if a rock talked to me. A bush spoke. Well, of course, first he pulled alongside that bush to observe the strange thing that was happening there, wonderful fire that was not consuming it. And then a voice spoke to him, and then he trembled and took his shoes off and fell down on his face before that bush. What do you think a Pharisee would have said if he saw that? Bowing before a bush? Well, no, we're not... We're not Oriental people. We're Near Eastern people. We worship one God. We don't worship spirits and bushes or trees or rocks. Praise God. This was a very significant time, I'm saying, in Jesus' ministry. And if God the Father needed to have, if, if it was silent, if he walked in, rode in on this donkey here, and is supposed to fulfill these Old Testament prophecies that he's coming in the name of the Lord and evidently that implied people are supposed to be praising God because he is coming in the name of the Lord rejoicing shouting greatly because he's the king if he came in and people just looked up and well there's Jesus the carpenter well and they went back to work and there wasn't any praise God can't have his son come into the city like that he's going to make some stones start talking and I know that he did it in the long run as far as the Gentiles were concerned. He couldn't get some Jews to serve him and praise him. Then he said, all right, we'll fix that matter in a hurry. We'll throw you guys off and we'll bring a wild olive branch and graft it in here. So God can take care of him. He doesn't find someone to praise him. He'll take care of that situation. Amen. God is going to be praised. That's, what, that's what we're trying to say. God is going to be worshipped and praised Amen. with a loud voice. Amen. And if you don't do it, he'll find somebody who will. I will. I know that. He won't have to look very far. I will. If you will, he'll find somebody who will praise him. And if he can't find somebody, he'll find a rock. And if the rock say, no, we prefer not to, he'll find donkeys. And if they won't, he'll find something. And eventually, we're told he's going to make the wrath of the heathen praise him. Even the wicked are made for the day of judgment so God can get praise that he's been just in life and just on this earth. No man will be able to say to God, well, you didn't elect me. And so God will say, did you ever have an opportunity to turn and look to the moon and the stars and say, surely there's something bigger than I in this world? Amen. You had an opportunity. You thought that thought once and you repudiated it there. Or you formed an idol with your own hands and that showed you were foolish in your mind. You had an opportunity to serve God. You had an opportunity to know me. If you would have just called out to me, I would have re revealed myself to you. You never did that. You never did it. That's your fault, not mine. They'll never say to God, well, I wasn't predestinated. Only the hyper-Calvinists think dumb thoughts like that. God won't let anybody think that on Judgment Day, though. Amen. Well, I wasn't elected. You should have elected yourself, then. You're as elect as you want to be. Didn't he say, whosoever's thirsty, you are never thirsty. That's your problem. He said, if you're thirsty, then come, drink of the waters of life freely. It's yours. John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his unique son that whosoever will he didn't say whosoever is elected he said whosoever will but you got to be willing some people aren't willing to that's their problem not God's they would have just looked to the moon one night or looked to the sun one morning and said oh surely there's something better than what I'm living in life you know, I don't believe the scientific theories of how that was formed. There's just no way. There's too much happen chance and if and we don't know and there's too much of that involved. That doesn't satisfy my mind. The sun, why is it the earth just here? It's not 
two million miles closer and two million miles further we would be either too cold or too hot it's right here Right in the exact place, the distance, and it's tilted just the exact way so we have seasons like we need them instead of all heat or all snow. Right. And why are there only two sexes, not 18 or one, males, females, so they can, in all animals, humans, so they can reproduce? And how did it just happen that way? It didn't just happen that way. Right. Some intelligent being or force planned it all out that way. Well, you do start thinking and say, I want to serve that God. I want to know the God who made the world. I want to know Him. Amen. And He'll find a way to introduce Himself to you. You won't look very long. He'll introduce Himself to you. If you'll knock, He'll open the door. Amen. That's right. The heathen won't be able to stand before God saying, well, I was, a, I was a heathen. I wasn't born in America. It wasn't my fault I was a heathen. God will say, yes, it was your fault you were a heathen. You had as many opportunities as everybody else in the world to knock on the door. I would have opened. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You never did knock. That's why you never got the door open. You never knocked. Whoever knocks, the door's going to be open. Who's ever thirsty, God's going to give them that living water of John 4. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. So he said the stones would cry out. I believe the stones would cry out. As well as the Gentiles. I'll let that be a second interpretation. But it's got to be subservient to the most obvious one, stones are stones. Stones aren't people. People are people, and stones are stones. Unless the context would tell us. I mean, we're told over in Isaiah 40 that all um, grass withereth. Well, then we're told in the same passage there, all flesh is as grass. Oh, so he's not talking about grass withering. He's talking about men. Oh, okay. Well, Isaiah tells us that in chapter 40. He said all the people is grass. I know are, but he said is. All the people is grass. So we know who the grass is or what the grass It's not grass in Isaiah 40. It's not flowers in Isaiah. It's people. It's the glory of man. His fashion is going to fail. But I don't read anything about people here in Luke chapter 19. I read about stones crying out. You know, there were some pretty big stones that made that temple up, that made that wall up, that made that city up. Amen. There were some pretty big stones there. How would you like, how would the Pharisees like to have heard all those stones just a creaking and a cracking the praises of God? <laughs> right in their own temple, on the altar, breaking forth, praising God. God could have caused that to happen. Amen. May have been better in the long run. <laughs> But, no, he really knows best, and he wants it from men. He doesn't want rocks to have to praise him. Rocks don't inherit the kingdom. Grass doesn't inherit the kingdom. Men do. People do. He wants people to praise him. Turn over to Psalm 98, if you will. I realize that there is a way. Some people will come up with this. The intellectuals will, I guess. That there is a way in which we can say that all of creation offers up praise to God. All of creation offers up praise to God. So they say, well, that's all he means by the rocks praising over there in Luke 19. He means that in the same way that nature, creation, offers up praise in Psalm 98. Verse 4, make a joyful noise in the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the heart, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. Now, I've never seen a rock play a harp yet, though, so we're still going to have problems. Or a tree blow a trumpet. With trumpets and the sound of the cornet or the horn, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together. Well, this is poetic language, obviously. Here, hills can't manifest joy because that's an ethical rational virtue and, and hills don't have that ability. So I'm sure what the psalmist is talking about is the very movement of nature. The movement of the water, the movement of the wind which calls the leaves and the trees to move and it looks like the whole hillside is moving. This is poetic language here, language of nature that represents praise to God. And so they say, well, that's all Jesus really meant over there in Luke 19. Well, I really don't think that's true because we've got to have some rejoicing and some loud praising of God, the King, who's coming. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Amen. How can the leaf say that? Or how can its movement demonstrate that? This is a messianic coming to Jerusalem of the Lord Jesus. And we have to have messianic praise that is appropriate for that. 
And a lot of what we're reading here in Psalm 98 deals with praise from human beings anyway. I mean, the joyful noise, all the earth, loud noise, rejoice, sing praise. That's all from humans. Sing to the Lord with the harp, the harp, the voice of a psalm, trumpets, make a joyful noise before the Lord the King. Then he goes into some of the other aspects of creation besides man, God's highest creation, let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. But then he goes right back into the world and they that dwell therein. Not the things, but they, the people that dwell therein. <clears throat> Let the floods clap their hands. Well, floods don't have hands. Well, surely we allow this in poetry, though. You can speak poetically that the floods with the caps have, as it were, hands which they clap. And I don't mean to get any Hindu, oriental, mystical, well, the floods are conscious that they're praising God type thing. That's certainly not to be sought out and discovered here. But God could cause inanimate objects not to have intelligence and reason and rationale, but he would speak through them, as it were. I don't think that the ass that Balaam was writing was reasoning out all of the processes going on. He had the right answer for all the things Balaam had to say, but God gave him the answer, though. He didn't think, now, I wonder if Balaam says this, what's my response going to be? Well, I'm going to give him a little, no, he didn't think of that. God just gave the ass the words and he spoke them. It's so interesting how people will read things in the Bible and say, if you ask them, do you believe the Bible's inspired? Well, yeah, I believe it. Until you really get down and force them into looking at what their confession has just placed them under. You know, you place yourself now under an oath to believe the whole Word of God. Do you really believe it? Here are the outworkings of that. Do you really believe that a donkey spoke? Well, they would say yes in a Sunday school class until... You really forced it on him. Do you believe he talked? Now, do you understand? We mean talk. I mean words. I mean language, human language. Do you believe he said complete sentences with predicates and verbs and predicate nom? Do you really believe that he said that? He did. And, you, and they might say, well, I believe that happened. A fish swallowed Jonah and all that. But the stones cry out? No, I think that means Gentiles. Well, it could. But it probably means something before it means that. Though. The Gentiles did cry out and praise God, did receive him as king, as Messiah. The Messiah wasn't promised to them, by the way, but they did receive him. But I believe it refers to the stones. I have another passage of Scripture before we're through this morning, over in Matthew chapter 21. We're talking about those religious Pharisees, the worst critics of true spiritual worship, who will always try to shut you down Shut your mouth down. Shut your dancing down. Mm -hmm. That was a Pharisee. I'm sorry if it sounds the way it sounds. I don't know if I am sorry or not, but I just say that so I appear like I'm <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> that was a Pharisee that told those people in our church long ago, those people who aren't here anymore, because they told those people in our church long ago, shouldn't do all that dancing running around. Those people who called church leadership up and said, we got people grabbing us, wanting us to dance in the aisles. Those were Pharisees, you see. Those were Pharisees. So what if that was a little extreme? It won't hurt you. You've been extremely wrong for so many years in your life. It won't hurt you to be extremely right for a while. It won't hurt you at all. Oh, and people just, they just get afraid and... Some people you see in a charismatic service, people start dancing and right away they get nervous. As soon as it happens, they start getting nervous. People are going to expect me to do that now. Yeah, that's right, we are. Ha <laughs> ha! That's right, we are. You better be nervous. We're going to imagine so. Are you nervous? Are you? We believe in the open in this church. You can't hide anything from us or from God anyway. <laughs> Praise God. I want you to know that you're free to worship God. Now, you don't have to if other people are doing it, but you're free, and you ought to want to. Amen. You ought to want to. One of the sisters shared after that other teaching that we had, if any of you have never really experienced the freedom and the liberty in running around with a tambourine and praising God, you ought to do it. Amen. Praise God, you ought to do it. There is real freedom and liberty in that when you be obedient to the Lord. It doesn't matter what people think, like, think about you or what you look like. There's real freedom in that. I want you to know, I want you to know, I want you to know this. I know God does, but I want you to know this. In this church, you're free to worship God. I'm not afraid of any hysterical yippings and yappings. I'm not afraid of that. 
I've got more to fear of people who don't praise God. That's the only thing I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of the other. I'm not going to digress and say, but we expect... I'm not even going to digress any. I'm just not afraid of any yippings and yappings. I believe that you'll worship God in spirit and in truth. If you want to go outside the building and run around the building one time, you're not out of order. <laughs> Praise God. You ever felt like doing that? I just want to go out and run. Go run. You're not out of order. I know in a lot of even charismatic churches, come on now. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tolerate that. They wouldn't look down on that. Oh, that's disorder. I don't read in the Bible that's disorder. I don't read that David was out of order to run and leap and dance before God. Well, now, what if, well, just don't get your intellect into it. What if they're going down there and he's going down to Route 30 and they're going over to 149? <laughs> And you come down to teach, and Dale's the only one here. <laughs> or we're here, and Dale's gone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jericho marches are probably scriptural. They did it in the Bible, a good Jericho march. Oh, my, there have been a lot of people who, A, would never have been able to be quiet for that long. Because people just talk, 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 yak, yak, yak all the time. And then B, whenever it was time to talk, they had to talk very loud and they would have been afraid or embarrassed to do that. They would have missed God on both accounts. They had to be quiet for six days and seven times around the seventh day and the last time a loud shout. And the walls came down. Look at all those stories we have in the Bible of what praise, what loud praise and loud shouting, what type of victory it brings. Hallelujah. Well, Matthew 21, 14 to 16, one other issue here we'll deal with. It's still under the religious Pharisees. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Praise God. There were some people that were mad over that, though. The people got healed. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things which he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, another messianic praise here, they were sore displeased. And he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? Or they say unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus' response was this, Yeah, I've heard. So what? Yeah? I hear, have you never read? Then we go back to that Christ-like sarcasm. He turns the tables on those who were supposed to be theological experts. And he exposes their ignorance, their gross, willful ignorance of the word of God. Do you hear these? Do you hear what they're saying? Yeah, I hear them. Have you ever read your Bible? Isn't that what he does? Yea, have ye never read? Now, what does that do to someone whenever you say that? That's a cut to them. Haven't you ever read your Bible? He exposes the willful gross darkness and ignorance of those who were supposed to be the experts of their day. Look at verse 15. The chief priests and the scribes, the modern day theologians, church leaders, pastors, whatever. Yeah, I hear them. That's not the question. The question is, have you ever read your Bible? Have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings Thou hast perfected praise. Perfected means just that. I looked it up in the Greek. There are other words you could translate, but it just means you've brought forth the right type of praise, that you've done the right thing, that God did the right thing out of the mouths of babes and sucklings with praise, with the right type of praise, which was Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. He perfected praise. Now, obviously, he doesn't, mean babes and sucklings or babes and sucklings only these were full-grown people who were saying it. i'm sure there were some children praising as well but the spiritual babes of matthew chapter 11 the spiritual babes hold your finger there because we're going to come back to matthew and flip over to where he gets this from and again it's back to the book of psalms psalm chapter 8 beginning with verse 1 this is a magnificent psalm here that begins, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hath set thy glory above the heavens. Now, I have to read that first verse because it starts off so transcendently and so gloriously, so otherworldly. 
who has sent thy glory above the heavens. We would tend to think, well, I guess he's just so glorious that that is beyond us. He escapes us. No. The God whom the heaven of heavens can't contain also fills the earth. And so he comes back down to us, to our level, earth, verse 2, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. Now that's literally what the Hebrew is, strength, and it's translated strength elsewhere. But it also can mean praise, though. Or it can mean this. It can mean the fact that people are praising God for his mighty strength. There's probably a combination of things. If you've ever wondered why do you have praise in the New Testament and strength in the Old, don't worry about it. It means God's strength for which he's worthy of praise in both places. It means God's strength, his mighty power, and who he is, his very being, all of that for which he is worthy of praise. Thou hast ordained strength out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. Well, you would know from the first part of the verse that surely more is meant than strength because what does that have to do with the mouth of babes and sucklings? It has to be utterance of some kind to connect it to mouth. And it's got to be ironic to connect it to babes and sucklings. In other words, it has to escape our intellect, escape the natural way things would be for it to have reference to babes and sucklings. Out of the mouth, are you understanding what I'm saying? It has to be some utterance. Out of the mouth, it has to be some utterance. So babes and sucklings, it's ironic. Babes and sucklings don't have anything out of their mouth as far as strength or praise is concerned. So it's ironic. It escapes what we would naturally think of. We would naturally think that the scribes and the chief priests would be the most proficient praisers of God, wouldn't we? That's what our intellect would tell us. They were trained. They knew the word of God. They had given their life. They had devoted themselves to the study of the word and to spiritual religious matters. All right. Two and two equals four. Doesn't hear, though. That would mean that they would probably be the best praisers, and they weren't. That's the whole surprise. They weren't. They were the worst praisers. They didn't praise at all. They praised themselves, remember. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. Well, how do you, what, what do you mean? You just got nonsense. You got strength out of the mouth? No, you'd have praise. Praise for the God who is the mighty God. And I like the end of this, and I think this is why Jesus quotes it over in uh, Matthew 21, 16. He doesn't quote the whole thing, but he doesn't have to. The scribes know the verse. They know the verse. He leaves off the most telling part of the verse, and he lets them fill in the details. Sometimes that's the best strategy. He le lets them finish quoting the verse. Because they could say, you didn't quote the rest of that verse. It's, it's, it says, oh, yeah. Yeah, it talks about his enemies. <laughs> oh, God's enemies. Yeah, that's right. Very wise Lord that we have. Because of thine enemies. Why does he ordain praise out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Because God has enemies. Enemies. To be critical of high praise is to be God's enemy. Amen. To say that person, they kind of got carried away. It's to be God's enemy. Because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. We find out who those people are in the New Testament. The scribes and the chief priests are God's enemies. They're God's avengers. They're out to get God. They have arrayed the kings of the earth and the religious kings have arrayed themselves against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's break their bands asunder. Let's be free from that restraint, that biblical teaching on we're supposed to praise God. So Jesus purposely leaves the end of the verse off and lets them quote it in their own mind. And it will be like John 8. They'll depart beginning with the oldest because they're the most guilty. They've lived the longest. He won't have to say anything else. They've had it with that. Look at verse 17 of Matthew 21, and he left them. That was the end of that. No more debate on that issue. Now, there are some other issues they begin debating, especially in chapter 22, but no more here. Don't you hear what they're saying? Yes, Jesus said, I heard. Haven't you read? Don't you read your Bible anymore? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. He doesn't quote the end of the verse. He lets them fill it in. 
Well, also here in Matthew, I think he's not only exposing their biblical ignorance, but he's showing us through this teaching a universal scriptural truth. And that is that the simple, the naive, the pure in heart, the innocent, the harmless, the childlike, have the better spiritual perception than the wise and the mighty. And they are more readily accepted before God. The open, the honest, the naive, the simple, the pure, the innocent, the harmless, the childlike, have better spiritual perception than the wise and the mighty. And they're accepted more readily before God. Well, isn't that Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 1? God has come to destroy all the wisdom of the wise and all the might of the mighty. He's come to put it to naught. He's come to ruin it and to expose it for fallacy and for foolishness that it really is. And he's come to triumph over that through whom? Through you, myself, through us. God gets the victory over the world. God gets the victory over the devil through us. God gets the victory over the enemies of high praise through those of us who believe in worshiping God with high praise. God doesn't come down himself. He doesn't praise himself. He expects us to. And he gets the victory over the wise and the prudent, the intellectual and the mighty, the know-it-alls, the falsely mature, the stuffed shirts, through the lowly and through the meek. Even... Matthew's Gospel elsewhere teaches this. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 4, the disciples came to Jesus and asked the question, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called that which would represent purity, innocency, the harmless, naive, simple spirit. He called a child and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children. You shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I told my wife the other day, I got home from work, from praying and studying one day, and I said, you know, what the Lord has shown me is how important it is to remain childlike, to remain poor in spirit before God, to remain innocent, harmless, just open and honest, transparent, because he rejects all those with pride, with something to prove, with some ax to grind. He rejects all of those. And he receives the lowly. Except you be converted and become as one of these little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, then were there brought unto him little children, we keep saying that, seeing that, little children. Then there are brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuke them. Just what the Pharisees said they should do. <clears throat> rebuke anyone who appears to be naive or simple or just candid. <laughs> rebuke them and praise God for the subtle, the sly, the deceptive, the wise, the crafty. And Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. That makes sense to me. That does make scriptural sense to me. That God wants to populate heaven with children. With children. They're so innocent, so candid, so forthright and pure and honest and, and wise in their own regard, in the right regard with all the wisdom of heaven, with all the wisdom of just common sense. That's true wisdom, common sense. A child often has all the wisdom of common sense. And all the purity of, well, of a child. What does he call a child? But what a child represents, what it stands for. Purity and innocency in their utmost. And he said that's what he requires of us. So to be critical of high praise, you see, we we join the wrong group of people. We're against our own calling in the future. We're against the angels. We're against Jesus because he smiles when we praise him. He smiles when we get the victory. 
and we're frowning because someone else is smiling too much, and we join the religious group called the Pharisees. We do everything but what we're supposed to do. We become critical of high praise or of those who believe in high praise and practice high praise. I'm preaching to us so that we can get a greater depth here in this area so we can really understand it from the Word of God. I'm preaching to us so that we don't fall prey to any other people's delusions. And I'm preaching to us so that we can begin to really enter into high praise and enter into these blessings and experiences ourselves. What did Matthew 15 say? There's more rejoicing. There's more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God in heaven over one sinner who repents. Then we don't need to get the there's more here than there. It's just there's praise, period, in heaven. A lot of it, a whole lot of it. Whenever one sinner repents or when one saint gets the victory, there's a lot of rejoicing, a lot of smiling in heaven. So there ought to be a whole lot of it going on down here. Amen. A lot of smiling and a whole lot of rejoicing. Amen. Remember, faith will move mountains, but praise will move God to move the devil out of your life. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you. We just praise you. What that is, it's a statement directed a little bit in this area that you might not have to claim and agonize and everything so often if you just say, I thank you, Father. I already have the answer. I'm just going to rejoice. I have the answer. And I'm going to spend time praising you that the, it's done. It's accomplished. It's finished. Faith will move a mountain, but, but it's going to take faith to move a mountain. So maybe rather than moving a mountain, it's a lot easier to move God. Just leave the mountain alone and move God with your praise and he'll move the devil to move the mountain out of your life then. He'll get rid of the situation. He'll deliver you. I believe there's such thing as high praise. As holy laughter. Anytime God or you, anytime we get the victory over the enemy and we steal the avenger, I believe in holy laughter. Praise God. I don't know about whether I believe in holy anointing oil flowing out of people's palms or not. We have a tape on that because they use some verse over in Hebrews 1. But I believe in holy laughter, though, because I know I've done it. And I believe in me. Amen. <laughs> just laugh. Oh, you just get... You're so caught up laughing. Laugh and say, what are you laughing over? Well, I've just got the victory. Praise God. God's a mighty warrior. God's a mighty warrior. Like that old battle horse over in Job's book, just pawing in the ground and snorting until you can hardly wait to get into the battle and get the victory. Amen. Laughing over it. Hallelujah. Praise God. We serve a God who has won. He has already won. Amen. You think about that and remember that. We're not looking forward to anything. We're looking back, back on something. We're looking in the past on something. It's all already been done. When? When he said it was done. And when was that? When he said it's done. It's finished. Amen. Whenever he said it's done, and then it's done. Oh, At the cross, every need of ours was met. Every need throughout all eternity was met. Oh, We're not looking forward to something. We're just praising God for what's already been done. We serve a God who's already gotten the victory over the enemy. He has already gotten the victory over the enemy. This is one of the wonderful things about our walk here. We're not in it kind of anticipating, well, God's strong, no question about that. And the odds are in our favor that at the end, when we get to the end of time, God's going to have whipped the devil. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, anticipation and um, fear that goes along with that because we're not for sure. We know he's strong. We think that he's going to whip the devil. The beautiful thing about our walk is we're already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus 
All of our needs have already been supplied. The victory has already been won. It's all already been done. We're just entering, we're just learning how to get in agreement with God and his word and enter into his fullness and his blessings. Amen. No good thing does he withhold or does he even want to withhold from those that walk uprightly. We're just learning how to walk uprightly. Amen. That's what we're learning. We're learning how to agree with God so we can get what God says is ours and his. You need to approach it from that way. We're not trying to get something from him, but we're trying to learn how to walk in his steps so that we are where he is. In all of his fullness, so that we can experience his fullness. In every area, in our home, in our marriage, with our children, in our body, in our bank account, everywhere. In our spirit, in our soul. He has won the victory. Hallelujah. Praise God. And we're learning to walk in that victory. Learning to walk in it. Hallelujah. That's what all of these instructions of the church are all about. We can learn to walk in the fullness of God. Because there's no shortage of power with God. The power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your body. So there's no shortage of power, but how do you release the power? How do you exercise it? Well, you can't in a sinful life. So how do you learn to release that power? How do you learn to walk in God's fullness? Well, everything that we study leads us in that direction. So we can grow up and go deeper with the Lord. Sister Ann, you want to lead us in your doxology again, and we can go into the next song then. Praise God. Hallelujah.